Welcome. This is the Sunday morning sermon for September the 29th of 2024 for Black Rock Baptist Church. And we're beginning a new series of messages this morning entitled Church Builders and Church Busters. And we're going to be looking at this over the next couple of months. This morning, we're going to start this, uh, this new series. It's designed to help us continue to foster healthy fellowship within our church. The kind of fellowship that develops friends that stick close together. I'm calling this series Church Builders and Church Busters, and we'll be looking at things that can help build the church and also things that can bust our fellowship and our relationships together uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ. This is a, an important biblical truth for us to uncover uh, because from time to time, church families like ours have to deal with uh, potentially divisive issues, issues that Satan would love to use to damage the sweet spirit that we enjoy in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Today, we begin our study by looking at a church buster. It's called sowing dissension. Our text is from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, which read like this. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies on a man who stirs up dissension among his brothers. Now, the unfortunate truth is that down through the years, this particular church buster has wreaked havoc, deadly destruction within the church of Jesus Christ. And it's happened over and over and over again. People have sowed dissension and they have destroyed friendships, marriages, and the precious congregational harmony that we seek. It's sad to say, but over the years as a pastor, there are have been several times that I've seen our adversary move weak, immature Christians, move them around like pawns on a chessboard, successfully tempting them to grumble and complain and gossip, and in the process, starting feuds that have wounded people so deeply that entire churches have been rendered ineffective for the kingdom. Now, as your pastor, I can't tell you how thankful I am for the harmony that we enjoy at Black Rock. That's not just words. That I'm not just saying that. We do indeed enjoy a sweet, sweet spirit around here. That spirit has been and is very precious. Not only because it uh, makes my job easier, and not only does it uh, keep us from an effective, or keep us as an effective tool in God's kingdom, I'm also thankful because our health and harmony is a source of strength for me personally as I live in this fallen world. Please hear me. In order to keep it that way, we must guard against this particular church buster especially when we deal with controversial issues in the church. I've told you many times in the past, but it bears repeating, that even though church harmony is a powerful thing, even though it's a source of strength, it's also a very fragile thing. And as such, it must be guarded and protected. That's what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. He says, we must be completely humble and gentle. We must be patient, bearing with one another. 
We must make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And I'm emphasizing the word must to help us realize that it is imperative that we understand this and that we refrain from sowing dissension in any way because keeping our fellowship healthy is essential. It's right up there with our belief that the Bible is God's infallible word, that Jesus Christ is God's only son, and that faith in him is the only way to heaven. We must maintain harmony in the body of Jesus Christ. Well, I believe in order to guard against this particular fellowship buster, to learn how to protect our harmony, the first thing we need to do is to remind ourselves what it is that motivates people to sow dissension in the first place. There are several such motivations, but I want to just mention two today. The first one, and it's a biggie, the first one is selfishness. You see, many people come into a church expecting the congregation to feed them, to entertain them, to serve them, to meet their needs. And when a church doesn't meet their needs or suit their taste, they complain and they gossip and they slander and they selfishly wreak havoc in a, converse, a, a congregation. Other people selfishly refuse to listen to another person's insights or perspective on an issue. It's either their way or the highway. Well, relationships in a body of believers must be the other way around. Not self-centered. They need to be other-centered. The purpose of the church is just uh, is not just mutual enjoyment, but mutual enrichment for spiritual development. In a healthy family, that's our focus, helping each other. And the same is true in a healthy spiritual family. It's a place where we work together to help not ourselves, but to help each other. We see this reflected in, in scriptures numerous times in the, the one anothering commands. I, I, I don't know how many of those there are in scripture, but there are many, many commands that refer to one another. Here's a sampling. In God's word, we're commanded to love one another. We're commanded to depend on one another, honor one another, rejoice and weep with one another, admonish one another, serve one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, and bear one another's burdens. So as you read through the New Testament, it becomes very obvious that God intends the church of Jesus Christ to be a selfless place, a place where we focus on others. When congregations realize that, they enjoy a truly blessed fellowship. But when Christians are self-centered, so often dissension is the result. Selflessness. A second motivator of those who spread dissension is what we'll call unrealistic expectations. Many people expect the church to be full of people who are easy to be with and fun to fellowship with, uh, people who are uh, always agree with them on everything. And when that doesn't happen, they do one of two things. Either they leave and continue their foolish search for the per perfect church, or they attack the imperfection they find in others. By its very nature, the church will be filled with imperfect people. People who at times are, yeah, hard to get along with. Remember, if you want to enter into a relationship with a fellow human being, there's only one way to do it, 
and that's as is. We take each other as we are. None of us are perfect. Think of it this way. If we enter churches looking for perfection, we're shopping in the wrong store. We're, we're shopping on the wrong rack. We've entered the wrong side because the church, like this fallen world of ours, is full of imperfect people. As Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We must passionately love the church in spite of its imperfections, longing for the ideal while criticizing the real. Well, I, I'm sorry, but that's just evidence of immaturity. Longing for the ideal while criticizing the real. Sadly, Christians don't have this level of maturity most of the time. They expect perfection in the church. And wherever they find flaws, they will sow dissension. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer refers to this when he says, those who love the dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community. Even though their personal or intentions may not uh, be directed in that way, that is the way it comes across. Okay, so to summarize what we've learned so far, Two of the main motivations behind yielding to temptation to, uh, to sow dissension in the church are self-centeredness and, and unrealistic expectations. Now, at this point, I, I'd like to flip things around so we can examine this particular fellowship buster from the opposite perspective by seeking an answer to the question, what is our motivation to steer clear of this sin. What is it that we should, that, that should compel us to preserve church unity and church harmony? What is it? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the basic truth that God commands us to strive for healthy community. Of course, that should be all the motivation that we need. The fact that God commands it, well, that should, that should do it. And by the way, he does. He does command it. Jesus said that all of God's laws are boiled down to two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, it is God's will that we embrace a healthy relationship with him and also a healthy relationship with our fellow man. In fact, the truth is, these two relational commands are really one command. They're, they're linked together in that you can't fully obey one without fully obeying the other. As John or First John chapter four verse nineteen says, if you say you love God but you don't obey Him by loving your neighbor, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. So these two greatest commands, these commands that Jesus said are foremost as we go about our lives, they're interlinked. They're linked together. We can't love God and not love each other. We can't love God and at the same time do things that damage the unity of our community of believers. And in our struggle with this particular fellowship buster, we need to understand that the priority of this command shows us that relational health is very important to God. We see this reflected throughout the written scriptures. 
In fact, the New Testament gives more attention to the unity of believers than it does to heaven or hell. For example, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others, building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In other words, he's saying build up or shut up. If you... If, you, if what you're saying doesn't add to the congregational health, don't say it. Well, the next verse says that when we ignore this command, when we damage congregational health with our words and our actions, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So like any earthly parent, our Heavenly Father grieves when his children fight among themselves. Our Lord wants us to love one another, to get along with one another. And if you doubt this, then look to the Gospel of John, where Jesus' final prayer before the cross is recorded. And in this prayer, Jesus says, I pray for these my followers, but I am also praying for all those who will believe in me because of their teaching. Father, I pray that they can be one. As you and are in me and I in you, I pray that they can also be one in us. Then the world will believe that you sent me. John chapter 17, verse 20 and following. Very clear. Now understand, knowing that the end is near, Jesus prayed one final time for his followers, and he prayed not for their success. He prayed not for their safety or their happiness, not even for doctrinal correctness. No, Jesus' final prayer was for their and for our unity. Foremost in our Savior's mind as he faced the cross was his desire that his followers would obey God's commands down through the ages and that they would enjoy healthy, loved-filled community with one another. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God wants unity at all costs. He doesn't want us to ignore disputes over the essential beliefs of our faith, if that's what it takes to make everyone happy. No, of course not. Genuine un unity would not be possible under those conditions. Our shared convictions, like those I mentioned earlier, are the source of our unity. They are the foundation of our congregational health. But what I am saying is this. Whenever we act unloving, whenever we gossip, whenever we slander or complain or grumble about things, whenever we carelessly and selfishly damage congregational unity and health, we're working contrary to the will and the nature of God when we do that. Let me put it a little more bluntly. Whenever we sow dissension, we're working for the enemy. Surely, knowing that should motivate us to steer clear from this deadly sin. Secondly here, The second motivation for us to do this is the basic truth that we all need community. I mean, we're not designed to work by ourselves. We're not designed to work alone. We need deep, genuine fellowship with other believers. We all need healthy community. We can't be Christians on our own. There's no substitute for a fellow believer to come alongside. 
We really do need each other. When we acknowledge God as our Father, every other Christian instantly becomes our brother or sister in Christ. And that's one of the wonderful things about our faith. Our mutual relationship with Jesus meets our inborn need for deep fellowship with others. We're empty otherwise. We've been We've been hardwired by God to love and enjoy relationships with other people. So two things that compel us to protect church fellowship are first, the fact that God, God's command, God commands us that we do this. And secondly, that we need to do so. We need each other. And then a final motivation for us to avoid dissension should be this. Number three, non-believers are attracted to healthy Christian communities. You see, because of humanity's need for community, non-believers are naturally drawn to healthy relationships. A church with a sweet, sweet spirit draws people like a campfire on a cold night. And this yearning is especially strong during these days. Because our society has become so disconnected. Think of it. Instead of face-to-face -face discussions, we rely on email and Facebook and Instagram and all of those things. The sad fact is that over the last 50 years, while society has been growing more and more prosperous and individualistic, our social connections have been dissolving. There's a price that we pay for our social disconnection. We volunteer less. We entertain guests in our home less often than we used to. We, people are getting married less. We're having fewer children. We have fewer and fewer close friends with whom we share our, the intimate details of our lives. We're denying our social nature, and friend, we're paying a price for it. Well, this lifestyle of isolation leaves a void in all people, and it's a void that all people want to fill. And many churches are realizing that filling this void can provide them with a chance to share the gospel with others. They've learned that the first step in evangelism is often just to give their non-believing friends a taste of authentic community. Loving, caring, inviting people. People naturally want to be around Christians who love one another. They like being in a place where instead of dissension, there's love. When people find a place where they are genuinely loved, my friend, you'll have to lock the doors to keep them away. So, unity fosters belief. But unfortunately, the reverse is also true. Disunity fosters disbelief. When we sow dissension, any time we act unloving toward others, it distorts our message, the message of love, and it drives lost people away from Christ. Let's be in prayer that we would be a people who are concerned about building the unity of believers within the local church. God bless. Have a wonderful day, and until we meet again, let's continue to exchange prayers daily.